I'm Lisa Christopher Stein, the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center co-founder and director. Today, we'll talk a bit about our increasing understanding of the role of cancer and myositis. We've long known about the role of cancer and myositis since the early 1900s. But in today's day, we are developing more precision to understand exactly how these two processes intertwine. In recent years, we have recognized that certain types of myositis, such as dermatomyositis, increase the risk for cancer, say versus other types of myositis, like inclusion body myositis, polymyositis, the antisynthetase syndrome, or immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Furthermore, we have now understood that certain autoantibodies confer an even increased risk. For example, among patients with dermatomyositis, those with certain autoantibodies, such as NXP2 or TIF1 gamma, are known to have an increased risk for cancer. There are additional modifying factors, such as older age or being a man, for example, that confer a greater risk still. But what we didn't really understand is that despite having these autoantibodies, why do some patients develop cancer and most actually do not? Trying to understand the precision and counseling our patients, and most importantly, if there were a tumor to develop, finding it early and working with our oncology partners would be of utmost importance. We understand now with work from two groups at Johns Hopkins that two additional autoantibodies seem to modify the risk for cancer even among those patients who might carry the highest risk. Let's break that down. So we talked about patients with TIF1 gamma autoantibodies. Those patients have the highest risk among our dermatomyositis patients for cancer. But two modifying autoantibodies, that to something called CCAR1 and another called transcription factor SP4, are telling us a little more. While these autoantibodies are not commercially available today, hopefully in the future, they can help guide care. What does that look like? One can imagine that a patient with TIF1 gamma has a certain chance of cancer, but we know that if they carry TIF1 gamma antibodies in addition to CCAR1 autoantibodies and even further autoantibodies with different specificities, the chance for cancer goes down. The hypothesis then is that the more autoantibodies a patient develops with myositis, the less chance they have of cancer. That lends to the hypothesis that the immune system is providing one of the most important and potent anti-tumor responses we know. So this is the idea of three E's, either escape, equilibration, or elimination. In the escape mechanism, this allows cancer to escape the immune response, and cancers are often found, unfortunately, at a later stage and confer a worse prognosis. In the middle, equilibration, cancer and myositis are often found together, but often that cancer is at a less severe stage and can be modified. Finally, in elimination, the best case scenario, the immune system does its job and eliminates the cancer. So while we see the autoimmune disease, we do not see cancer concomitantly. Additionally, the transcription factor SP4 antibody has shown us that in combination with TIF1 gamma, the chance of cancer is extremely low. But in the future, it is my hope and the hope of other rheumatologists and neurologists that treat myositis that we can precisely counsel our patients and reassure them when and if they will develop cancer, and most importantly, modify or mitigate that risk if we know early. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure.